call your attention to the book of Esther, the 8th chapter. Start this theme two weeks ago. Judges were Ruth, with Ruth, and now I want to close it out with Esther. Esther chapter 8, verse 15, chapter 8, verse 15, uh, reads like this. Then Mordecai left the king's presence, wearing the royal robe of blue and white, the great crown of gold, and an hour cloak of fine linen and purple. And the people of Susa celebrated the new decree. The Jews were filled with joy and gladness, and were honored everywhere. In every province and city, wherever the king's decree arrived, the Jews rejoiced and had a great celebration and declared a public festival and holiday. And many of the people of the land became Jews themselves, for they feared what the Jews might do to them. This is part three of our theme, Stay in Tune with God, but I want to specifically talk from the thought of violent victory. A violent victory. Stay in tune with God has been our thought for the last two Sundays. And when I am in tune with God, I make every effort to not do what seems right in my eyes. Rather, I consult the Lord in prayer as to what he would have me to do. When I'm in tune with God, I can go through pain, blessing and encouraging those who come into my care, while watching God transition my tragedy into praise. Today, as we culminate this thought, to stay in tune with God may come with violence, to obtain our victory. It's been stated on numerous occasions by many men and women of God that the church, the building, is a hospital for the sick. But may I suggest to this audience that the church, this building, is God's pre-deployment line before going outside into battle. How many of us can truly say that we are spiritually prepared for war? John 10 and 10, Jesus reminds us, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This is why Peter reminds us it's important to be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Like John the Baptist, we too have a charge to tell a dying people about Jesus Christ because as it was then and is now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence Violent, take it by force. In other words, from the days of John the Baptist until now, there has been an extraordinary rush of people pressing in from all sides, eager for a blessing. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence. Figurative, figurative, yeah, forget it. I can't say it. I've been practicing it before I got out here today. Y'all help me say it. Figurative, whatever. Figuratively. Yeah, why I'm thank you. <laughs> and that people, I still can't say it. <laughs> and that people were so thronging to hear the gospel that they resembled an army trying to besiege a city and the violent take it by force. 
the people entering the kingdom were not violent, literally, but their eagerness to see the coming of the Messiah was so overwhelming that it was as if they were attacking a city and beating down the doors to enter. As a follower of Jesus Christ, there's no place for apathy or ambivalence, but rather one who chooses to stay in tune with God should do so with earnestness as they strive to be closer to him. Amen. So again, I say to stay in tune with God may come with violence to obtain the victory. Esther chapter 8 verse 15 says, Then Mordecai left the king's presence, wearing the royal robe of blue and white, the great crown of gold, and an outer cloak of fine linen and purple. And the people of Susa celebrated the new decree. Well, I hear you. Some, if not all of you, just asked me, well, what was the old decree? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> In chapter 3 of Esther, King Xerxes promotes Haman, the Agite, over all the nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. In addition, the king commanded that all of his officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed. But similar to what happened in the book of Daniel, when the three Hebrew boys would not bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar's golden image, Mordecai, who was Esther's cousin, uncle, and guardian, would not bow to Haman. And scholarship suggests that Mordecai didn't bow not because he despised Haman, but rather Mordecai had to obey God. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, God forbid the Jews to bow to other gods. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Word gets back to Haman that Mordecai does not follow suit like all the others. So Haman became filled with rage and pride, knowing that Mordecai was a Jew. Because Mordecai failed to bow down to this prideful man, Haman didn't think it enough to destroy Mordecai alone. So he plots to annihilate all the Jews throughout the entire empire of King Xerxes. Haman approaches the king and says this, there's a certain race of people. From the book of Exodus to the 19th century, it was slavery. In the 50s and 60s, it was to fight the civil rights. Now today, it's the law on immigration. Haman approaches the king and says, there's a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. Haman's wounded pride surfaced as hatred, for he could not control Mordecai, and so he hated him and generalized his hatred to, all, to include all Jews. In his racial hatred, he is another in the long line of those who have persecuted the Jews in the past and in the present. The racial hatred tries to bolster itself with the myth that one tribe is superior to others. But no race, nationality, or tribe is superior to any other. Amen. For God has created all for purpose. And we need to remember that God is against all unfair discrimination and opposes the ethnic fighting that destroys rather than builds the human race. Amen. In Esther chapter 3, verse 8, Haman says, 
So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it pleases the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And not only that, I will go in my own pocket and give 10,000 sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited into the royal treasury. The king agrees to Haman's plea and removes his signet ring, giving it to Haman, saying the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. A decree was written as Haman dictated and sealed with the king's signet ring, then sent throughout all the land. The decree stated that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day, and the property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. After the decree had gone out, the Bible says the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city fell into confusion. Now, I'm not here to discuss politics, because that's not what this hour is for. But it reminds me of much of the climate in our political society today back home. Shoot, even here in the United Kingdom. When Mordecai learned what was going to take place with him and his people, he tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and went into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far to the gate of the palace as he could in his morning attire to gain the queen's attention. Y'all, please don't use that door. When the queen learned that Mordecai was at the gate deeply distressed, she sent out clothes for him to change, but he refused. After his refusal, Queen Esther sends her attendant to find out what's going on. With Esther living in seclusion of the palace, she was not aware of what was going on in Susa. Esther's ignorance is a reminder of another danger facing those in leadership positions. Leaders can become so remote from their followers that they do not know what is going on in the daily lives of those who follow and hence make wrong decisions. It's important to not only know what's happening in the house, but what's happening outside the house as well. Mm -hmm. Mordecai sends the message to Esther about what's going on and directs her to go to the king. But Esther sends word back to Mordecai saying that anyone who goes to the king uninvited will die unless he holds out his gold scepter to receive them not to mention the king had not called Esther into his presence for 30 days. Mordecai sent one last reply to the queen, to the queen saying, now don't you think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. Esther, my niece, my daughter, my loved one, if you keep quiet at a time like this, mm -hmm. deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. And who knows if perhaps you were made queen at such a time as this. Esther tells Mordecai, I'm in. If I must die, I must die. So go and gather all the Jews of Susa and fast for me three days. For she knew before the words of Jesus that this kind can come forth by nothing 
but by prayer and fasting. A lot of times we want to consult other people about situations that are transpiring in our lives before taking the first step of going to God in prayer. Yeah. But not only must we go to God in prayer, if you haven't turned the plate down or sacrificed something that you will desire, then my brothers and sisters, you may want to turn to prayer and fasting. So before Esther followed Mordecai's plea, Esther went and got beautified, put on her royal robes, and entered the inner court of the palace. And it just so happened, the king was sitting there chilling on his throne and looked up and saw Queen Esther. And when he saw her, he welcomed her by holding out his gold scepter. And can't you hear him? Hey, baby! <laughs> Come on in. Queen walks in and touches the scepter. And Big Daddy, I mean the king, says, what can I do for you? Whatever it is, I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. Esther didn't immediately make her real request. Instead, she invites the king and Haman to a banquet. So Haman is summoned immediately, and the three of them sit down to eat and drink. Scholarship suggested Esther was following Middle Eastern custom, where business deals traditionally follow meals. So while they were eating and drinking, the king asked her again, what is it that you want? And for the second time, Esther does not respond with her real request. But she asked that Haman and the king join her tomorrow for another banquet. So Haman leaves the banquet feeling mighty good until he saw Mordecai at the palace gate. Mordecai wasn't standing up. He wasn't trembling nervously in Haman's presence. And Haman became furious, but held it all together and went home. When Haman got home, he's sitting around talking with his wife and a few friends, boasting about all his favor that has come upon him, but at the same time upset because Mordecai won't bow to him. Haman had everything he wanted and more. And yet one person could make his life miserable. Is that anybody in here? Amen. Sure look at nobody. <laughs> the Lord blessed you with everything you want. But every time you see that one person, the inside just turn up. And you forget about all your blessings focus in on the hate or the negativity you have toward that other person. Haman was so quick to focus on the negative that he allowed the negative to spoil his enjoyment of his blessings. Mm. For he told his wife and his friends that his pride could no longer tolerate Mordecai. That's the chapter 5 verse 13. But this is all worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting there at the palace gate. So Haman gets some bad advice from his wife and his two friends who encourage him to set up a stake. And not just a little one, but a stake that is 75 feet tall that the whole empire could see who hung on kill Mordecai. But that night, <laughs> the Lord has a way of disrupting your sleep. Because mm. chapter 6 tells us that the king couldn't go to sleep. The king called for an attendant to bring the book of history of his reign 
so it could be read to him. And it just so happened when they opened the book, they opened up to that part that talked about the account of how Mordecai had exposed the plot of those who attempted to kill the king in chapter 2. So the king wanted to know if Mordecai was compensated for his loyalty, and the attendant replied, nothing has been done for him. The king asked who was in the outer court, and it just so happened to be Haman. The king summoned Haman to come into his presence, and the king asked his opinion. Haman, what should be done to honor a man who truly pleases the king? And Haman, in his selfish pride, thought to himself, whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So his response laid out what he wanted the king to do for him. Mm. Esther chapter 6, verse 7. So he replied, if the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes, as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden, one with a royal emblem on its head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, and let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robe and led through the city square on the king's horse. Have the officials shout as they go, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Now that sounded real good to the king, so he commanded Haman to take the robes and the horse and go do just what you said for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the gate of the palace. And oh yeah, Haman, don't leave out nothing you suggested. Can't you see Haman's face right now? <laughs> this is for the kids that got boo-boo all over him. <laughs> Mordecai returned back to the palace gate, and Haman hurried home dejected and completely humiliated. When Haman told his wife and friends, what had happened, they said to him, since Mordecai is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. It will be fatal to continue opposing him. And shortly after they said this to him, Haman got picked up to attend the queen's second banquet. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. For those of us that feel that God is silent in our lives and wonder where God is when we face difficult situations, Rest assured that he is working behind the scenes. As the story continues, and Haman sits down at the table of the banquet with the king in Esther, the king asks for the last time, baby, what you want? <laughs> what can Big Daddy do for you? Whatever it is, I'll give it to you even if it's half the kingdom. But Esther says this, if I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. Now let me stop right here and say, Mordecai instructed Esther to not reveal her nationality when she took office. But the people knew that Mordecai was of the Jewish faith. But here in Esther's plea for survival, she unveils 
her nationality. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I would remain quiet, because that's not uncommon. For that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. So the king gets up. Who would do such a thing to my baby? Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? And Esther replies, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. And Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped up to his feet in rage and went out into the palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind, begging the queen to spare his life. <laughs> and because of his position, a position of begging to be spared, the king walked back in and thought Haman was trying to attack his wife in his presence. The king exclaimed, will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? As soon as the, the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, which meant Haman was about to die. And can I rush along, because I'm out of time, and say that the very stake that Haman had for Mordecai that was 75 feet tall in the mm. sky was used, was used for himself? Mm -hmm. My grandmama would say this, if you dig one ditch, you better dig two, because the trap you set for me just might be for you. Be careful how you plot evil upon other people. Amen. Because God will turn around yeah. and put you as a victim to your own plans. Mm -hmm. I gotta go. But chapter eight, Haman and Mordecai got together and spoke to the king and said, King, we still wanna save our people. But when the king made a law or when a decree was issued with the king's signet, that law could not be undone. And the king told him, y'all get together and do what you need to do to save your people. But remember, that law is still in play. So they had to get together without undoing the law. But this time they gave the Jews the ability to not just be attacked, but to be able to defend themselves when the attack hit. Brothers and sisters, God has given us the weapons that we needed to attack the enemy. And those spiritual uh, things that come up against us, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, to fight against the enemy. It doesn't matter what you're going through in life. You're going to have to fight. Yeah. But you need to be in tune with God. To know what to attack. Amen. Because the enemy has been plotting and planning against you all the time. But the question is, will you be ready for a violent victory? Can't be no weakling as a believer. You gotta have the strength that God gives us to fight against the enemy. And the beautiful thing is, scripture tells us that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So whatever you're going through today, pull out your spiritual weapons, gird up to fight and battle, because God has given you the victory. Amen. Let us pray.